नमस्कार डीना वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन थैंक यू सो मच फॉर बींग पार्ट ऑफ दिस सीरीज एंड लाइक विद अलॉट ऑफ फ्रेंड्स आई वुड लाइक टू फर्स्ट आस्क वॉट इज यूर अर्लीस्ट मेमोरी ऑफ इधर द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ द एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ अहिंसा Thank you, Rajni. I first of all congratulate you to have taken this project of Ahimsa Conversations for such a long kind of a life, because these are all brave attempts in mining the concept of Ahimsa, which is now out of fashion for a long time. And it's very important that we have to have uh, a sort sort of renew of the our understanding of these fundamental core concepts of philosophy. And I'm so happy that you've taken it up for such a long time, and now it's the 93rd episode, and I'm very, very privileged to be with you on this conversation. About my first uh, experience of uh, the word called ahimsa is from childhood, because people growing up in the early 60s just can't escape hearing this word, either at home or in the society, in the social structure, or in the schools. Because that is the high noon of our Indian Republic, when Jawaharlal Nehru was still alive, Gandhi was a kind of an icon. Almost every every kind of a discourse, and of course there were so many multiple understandings of the Gandhian spirit, and Ahimsa was always in there. So that's nothing. I can't just say that I was surprised by the word Ahimsa. It was something which was like the oxygen for all of us. But Kerala. Uh, I think there was a particular context in Kerala. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, Kerala, because uh, the, I, what I remember is that in my very small early childhood, uh, the, the 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 state was ruled by the first communist government, which was elected in the world by through democratic process, and uh, the, the the discussions which used to happen. Between uh, the pro-communists and the anti-communists, who were mostly liberal, conscious people, we are always on the matter of not on the base of ideology of uh, distribution and equality and other things which communists used to harp upon, but the discussions is always to be on the issue of violence, because Congress, which was the main party, opposition party at that time, used to talk of the communists as very violent people who don't have any faith in the Gandhian path of. So they she or ahimsa or such things, and the communists used to be quite uh, labouring hard to prove that you know our understanding of ahimsa is that you can have a relativistic view of it, not an absolutist view, but it didn't catch much of a, a purchase among the opponents. So this kind of a dialectical interaction between the the, the pro-communist and the anti-communist, and in every family used to have these people who were supporting the communists. Some of my uncles were all communists. My father was a pro Gandhian congressman. So when they meet, they inevitably, inevitably, these discussions will come up over it. So I can say that from the time I started eating solid food, I've been hearing these kinds of <laughs> discussions. So uh, ahimsa is almost a part of our daily discourse. As a as a as a scholar of Sanskrit, uh, even though you like to say that you are a hobby scholar. Uh, i know that you have some reflections on the framing of the term ahimsa and in how it is located in the larger indic frame so could you say something about that yeah actually ahimsa is a malayalam word also you see because over almost 60 70% of the lexicon of uh, literary malayalam is sanskrit or prakrit which are very similar to each other so i didn't even realize that ahimsa was a sanskrit word much much later in my life when i was a uh, uh, adult so we used to take ahimsa as a very positive kind of a word you know not as a negative word because fundamentally people say non violence in english which is not a very true translation for ahimsa but uh, it says that violence is the kind of a default condition and you have to be working hard to be non violent that kind of a you know connotation it has got the word violent non violence has got You're saying that is. We always thought that the ahimsa was a very positive thing. That one has to be by default a human being is uh, uh, non-violent. You got to really work hard to become violent. So, but later when we started reading, uh, you know, philosophy and other things, uh, we started understanding that it's not that simple. It's a very complex word. But I have my own unorthodox understanding of ahimsa, 
that is uh, i think it's a double negation because himsa itself is a negation of existence so you negate uh, negation you become a double negation so it's a very dialectical concept what is the significance of that ah uh, the main significance is that it can never be brought down to an absolutist position you have to take uh, non violence uh, in a very relativistic very practical kind of a view point this is gandhi i think understood it very very fundamentally that's why he always used to say that uh, ahimsa is not for the coward it's for the brave which is very 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 difficult statement to understand actually it's very easy to say that uh, majboori ka naam mahatma gandhi which is actually one of the most uh, travesty of the concept of ahimsa so i think uh, the dialectical understanding of ahimsa is much better than taking a mechanistic simple uh, you know understanding of the world in this context dina how would you locate the legacy of shri narayana guru uh, i know that's a very big question and uh, can you for the sake of uh, our audience maybe begin at the beginning because uh, uh, th- this uh, program does have a global audience so can you uh, introduce uh, guru uh, to those who may have not heard of him i come from a place called varkala in kerala which is actually the place where guru stayed most of his adult time so can't escape the the, the breeze which flew in from the ashram and um, guru is actually a very enigmatic personality for the modern historian because uh, he can be anything which you want him to be for the advaitin he is a advaita advaita practitioner of the most sophisticated variety for the uh, left liberal crowd he is a social reformer his philosophy is just a footnote to his social reforming process and uh, for the poet he is a uh, absolutely brilliant poet who wrote not in one language or two languages but in three languages so he can be a very kind of uh, complex personality to define but about guru's understanding of ahimsa on a surface level i can say that he was uh, a big promoter of ahimsa in fact he has written uh, poems uh, working against uh, any kind of uh, killing including killing for food he was a man who who who, who promoted vegetarianism and he said that it's if you don't kill kill an animal for uh, food uh, nobody will be there to buy it for eating so he he actually appealed to the butcher to stop killing in this current contemporary times it can be misused for attacking the poor butchers but he was a fundamentally he was a man who was who said that violence to any any any, any organic being including plants and hills and rocks and anything is basically a violence against oneself one's own self because he was a person who believed in the uh, overpowering perverting uh, entity called the self so violence was very much part of his uh, philosophy and uh, he I was uh, so non- i mean non violence was very part of his uh, philosophy and he was uh, he was a very mild person who will never talk anything in a kind of an aggressive way so he used to put it everything in a in a soft literal you know literary sense dina can you uh, dwell a little more deeply on the all pervading self because again uh, i would like you to uh, explain briefly uh, the advaita of uh, shri narayana guru uh, to uh, those who would never have heard of the concept before yeah guru has written a poem my poem a big poem a long poem not very long medium size poem in malayalam called advaita deepika so he has defined what advaita is you know in that and then his darshana mala which is a, a book of 100 stanzas in sanskrit it is almost like a prakarana grantha he has written in anishta meter that also talks about the the the, the different manifestation of the prakriti and the, the, the spirit and the atma and um, how everything is like a garland you know it's a thread of a garland in which all the the, the reality is being strung on and um, 
he is very clearly says that his uh, his is an experiential self uh, guru basically uh, was his understanding of self was not a scholastic understanding of self it was an experiential understanding of self you should remember that he had uh, spent uh, years in caves in a place called maruto malai which is very close to the the the, the tri junction of the indian ocean the bay of bengal and the uh, arabian sea and on top of the hill he is to sit in a cave and meditate and he practiced his uh, tantric practices tantric in the sense of the the, the way the 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 the, the, the rigorous uh, kundalini practices he has done and then he came out of it with a, as a person who realized what the secrets of existence is and he could have actually remained in that state and continued being a kind of a muni a, a person who is a sanyasa but he, but he chose the other path of coming back to the people and uh, trying to help them out on the basis of the insights he received and he has very clearly written his experiences in many of the poems uh, not very ostensibly uh, about it but you can also decipher it when you read through it that this comes from his experience not out of his reason so uh, he talks about how at the point of the ultimate realization you become one with a effulgence and then you are uh, transcending the time that you can see the past the present and the future all this is written in his uh, atmobudesha chatakam very clearly that you become a photon yourself and then you move at the speed of uh, the velocity of light then there is no past no present no future everything is visible to you the time dilation concept as you say in physics so these kinds of experiences he had now rationally we cannot say whether he was uh, really when he went through it but the consistency in which he has shown afterwards the consistency of his experiences he has explained through his action and his literary work shows that he had gone through some kind of an epiphanic uh, moment in the in, in his uh, tapasya inside that uh, on top of the mountain so all this his um, work which has had a lot of ramification in the social sphere the current kerala is actually a kind of an after effect of the 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 whole philosophical and uh, sociological praxis he had uh, indulged in he is uh, basically very consistent and absolutely he has done um, he has he has never tried to impress anyone with his uh, scholasticism or his uh, reasoning ability or anything but in spite of all that everything comes through as a very you know un- uniform whole that is why he is so relevant even now today we are sitting one almost 100 years after he 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 passed away from the world we are still sitting and talking about him you know, that's the reason yeah, yeah. did you know the fascinating thing about guru is that having uh, in a sense uh, had access to the completely esoteric realm he chose to uh, fight a battle deep inside the society and it was a battle for the dignity of the so called lower castes so can you describe that to some extent and how the way he chose to uh, take up that issue uh, in what ways that also manifested a philosophy of non violence actually guru never never knew that he was fighting a battle because he was not a man who was interested in creating barricades on the other hand he was equally sympathetic towards both the oppressed and the oppressor he thought the oppressor is as much uh, the suffering part of the suffering system as the oppressed oppressed is so people used to ask him that when people come and for such a great saint like you you are being treated like a like a like an untouchable or something how do you how do you react to that someone asked him so he said i feel pity for them they don't know the whole scriptures in on which they are basing their arguments they all look at the whole human uh, human being as one single whole there is absolutely no difference between one human from the other there is no othering of the human every human is part of one whole self so i feel pity for them i never feel any kind of anger or uh, anger or um, you know resentment towards them so you can see from the guru's point of view he was not doing any battle he was only opening up the kind of a morass the crust which had which had deposit which had been depositing over centuries over the society 
and he sort of unraveled the truth to everyone, both the oppressor and the oppressed. It so happened that the, 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 the benefits were visible for the people who were at the bottom of the pyramid, but the benefits were there for the people who were oppressing too. They also got liberated because they became part of a more democratic, more uh, uh, you know, equitable and a more fraternal society. So he was not doing any battle. He was actually opening up the eyes of both the oppressor and the oppressed. Yes. That is true. At the same time, his decision to uh, consecrate a Shiva idol uh, was revolutionary at that time. Could you locate that in this larger film? Yeah, but that exactly is again uh, comes as a follow up of my earlier argument that he didn't go there to open up the temples of the uh, the, 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 the oppressor who were uh, keeping 80% of the Hindu society away from the places of worship, saying that they don't have the karmic balance to enter the temple. Instead, he said, why do you want to go there? I'll make better temples for you, where you can play. So this actually took the bottom out of the oppress oppressor, because then uh, he knew 80% of the people start going to other temples, and our temples will become irrelevant. You know? So they opened up the temples there, their own temples. So he used, this is a kind of a, what do you call, this is called what we call the gracious uprooting. You can uproot a system without having resentment, without having anger, it's called a gracious uprooting. This is a word taken from the great Japanese philosopher Gajin Nagao. And uh, he talks, he defines uh, Praditya Samalpada as, uh, no, not Praditya Samalpada, sorry. He uses the word Prapancho Pashamam Shivam, which is a, uh, it's a phrase which is available in Nagarjuna's uh, Mula Madhimudva Karika, he uses this, uh, arg this argument to say that this is Prapancho Upashamam Shivam actually is gracious uprooting. And in fact, we all believe that Guru had done some kind of a gracious uprooting of the, uh, the, 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 the wrong, uh, uh, deeply crusted traditional uh, systems of the society. That's all he did. He didn't do any. He's a kind of a man who cleaned up the system. He's not a man who fought the system. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, how do you then locate this gracious uprooting in the kind of revolutionary energies which were un, uh, unleashed upon the world uh, in the 20-30 years after Guru? Of course, Guru lived at the time of the Russian Revolution. Uh, though I don't know if that in any way uh, touched his life, the news about that. Uh, but can you locate the many efforts to reform society through revolutionary change in this context? Well, yeah, Guru was a product of his time, though he didn't know English. He was very much aware of what is happening in the world because many of his disciples were high scholars of English. Many of them used to write books in English. And um, you should remember when you talk about this um, the parallel uh, between Russian Revolution and Guru's being there, I have to take it back to the to much more preliminary level. The Guru was born in 1855. Some people say 1856, but I would like to believe he was in 1855. 1855, just in his teenagers, I think the American Civil War was almost over. And the American Civil War had changed the whole lands, the whole commercial nature of uh, you know the Western coast. Because because of the American Civil War, you know, there were a shortage of oil seeds and uh, in, in, in England for their soap factories and they had alternative cultivations of uh, different oil seeds and coconut became a commercial product. The whole Kerala and Western coast economy actually boomed because of the civil, American Civil War. And uh, the new bourgeoisie came out of it, of this uh, commercial uh, cultivation of coconut and its other products. They had created a lot of new changes into the, the, the economic and social structure. Guru was a part of this. Guru actually was influenced by all this. He was a very intelligent man. He would have been very much aware of what is happening in the world. That the, the static world of about a thousand years is suddenly changing. Then you have the new, new century, the 20th century, electricity coming to cities and uh, the, the railway coming. In fact, he uses in some of his bhakti poems, he uses the word rail and jail and all, English words. Because he's such a such such an aware man, he knows that the world is changing, and uh, he must have been aware of the Russian Revolution, and he would have been he would have been probably approving of it in a kind of a uh, 
in a, in a kind of a theoretical way, but would have been disapproving of the violence unleashed by the revolution. And that's why he never had any time for these kinds of agitations. Even for Vaikam Satyagraha, which Gandhiji promoted, he came over there to support it. The Guru was always indifferent about it. If it happened, let it happen. But we don't need an agitation. We can have our temples. Why do we need an agitation for that? We can have separate temples. But once it happened, he started uh, encouraging them in the sense uh, not allow their morale to come down. And all that he did. Dina, can you say a bit more here about the Vyakam Satyagraha? What was the issue? And how did Gandhiji get involved? And, I, and then a little bit about the Gandhi Guru dialogue. <laughs> That's one of the most famous dialogues that all millennials know about it. And uh, Vyakam was a, a temple which never allowed the Lokas to walk on the not enter, entering it was very, it was totally banned, but people couldn't even walk on the streets uh, which was uh, on the sides of the temple. So they have to take a long circuit, circuitous route to just uh, go to from one house to the other. So, but if you become a, a Christian or something, if you convert yourself to Christianity, you're allowed because the British Empire will ensure that, you know, such rules will not be possible. So, this kind of uh, inequality of access, uh, Gandhiji came to know through some of the people from Kerala and he said that uh, you have to go for a satyagraha, you have to go for a non-violent struggle for that. So, that's how uh, these people organized it and, and it had all, even uh, the leaders from the enlightened sections of the, the upper caste, the lower caste, everyone were part of it and it was a long, long kind of a satyagraha. In fact, the Akalis had come from Punjab to start a langar. The, I think the Malayalis have started eating chapatis only after that. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it went on and on for a long time. But I don't think it was a successful thing in the immediate sense, but it had created a lot of ripples, both among the oppressed and the oppressors. And in this context, what was the dialogue? What was the nature of the... Because Gandhiji and the Guru did meet. So... Can you See, Gandhi, Gandhiji came to uh, Varkala, Shivagiri, the ashram where Guru was there and they met and uh, they were talking and uh, very, very interesting beginning of the conversation. It's very interesting because uh, people, people who may not know it can have a good laugh at it because Gandhiji started the conversation saying, does the Guru, does the, uh, does the Guru, I think, does the Guru speak English? So the translator told Guru that, oh, yeah, this is the question. So, Guru just asked him back, does the Mahatma speak Sanskrit? So, so two Indo-European languages, you know, so both of them were ignorant of the other language. So, there it ended this conversation and then they started using the interpreters. And Gandhi uh, was quite uh, skeptical about uh, the, the, the untenability of uh, Varnashrama and Dharma, which Guru said that when uh, the same self pervades in all human beings, you can't have an upper, a different Varnashrama. Everyone is one ashrama, one species, the human species. But uh, Gandhi showed him the, the mango tree, the leaves of the mango tree and told him that, look here, this tree, the leaves of the trees are very different. Aren't the human beings also different that way? So Guru said, why don't we just pluck a couple of them and start chewing each one of them and you see the essence is the same. It seems this had a huge impact on Gandhi and you can see that this was in 1924 or 25 and in the 30s Gandhi had changed his whole concept of Atrashrama and Dharma. He went headlong to untouchability, movements and other things. And this is a very famous story which uh, everyone talks with a lot of laughter, you know, after telling the story. <laughs> uh, people laugh, both the Sanskrit story as well as this uh, essence of the leaf story. So, it was nice, it was two great uh, souls meeting and having a discussion itself was something for a small town like Parkala. It was something, you know, I would have been a fly on the wall, you know, or fly, fly on the tea, tea, uh, tree trunk to listen to the conversation if I were alive that <laughs> In later years, uh, Guru's legacy has inspired a very wide range of action in, um, in Kerala. In what particular way did it lead you and your friends to set up the Backwaters Collective? Before we go into what is the Backwaters Collective, can you uh, help us to understand the connection between Guru's inspiration and you're all coming together in this way? Oh yeah, but uh, Guru came in an indirect way to us. 
because uh, I am I was working in uh, BRC in Bombay, and I knew many people in many walks of life. And one person used to work with the Sri Narayana Mandira Samiti, which is an institution which was running a few schools and other things in Bombay for the uh, weaker sections of the society. He was doing a tremendous job there, doing junior college, and they do a lot of good work. And this person used to know me, and he also knew that I was interested in the poetry of Guru. So one day he calls me up and says that there is an inquiry from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka has got a Sri Narayana Guru Society of Sri Lanka, which is a pal. It's a, it's a it's a society accredited by the Parliament of Sri Lanka. And they came after the civil war. They wanted to start to revive their society, and they wanted an international conference to be organized in Colombo. That was in 2010. Uh, about January or something. I mean, September. So this gentleman uh, said, "Why don't we are doing a preliminary discussion on this? Let us have a uh, see. We wanted your inputs on what kind of conference we can organize." So I said, "Let's call people like Ashish Nandi and all because let's do something which is not a very Kerala centric thing, but something which is global." So we got Ashish Nandi from uh, Delhi. Vinay Lal, that time from University of Los Angeles, was there in Delhi. He also came over. Then Robbie Rajan from Wisconsin came, and we had a few other people from uh, different parts of India and the world who came over there, and we had a one-day conference on on peace, peace and global brotherhood. Of course, since it is organized by the Sri Narayana Guru Society, it had a kind of uh, accent on the principles of Guru's philosophy, and it was a hugely successful thing because after this uh, horrible uh, civil war, which this is the first. Uh, Major intellectual conference which happened in Sri Lanka, and it was totally, totally supported by the Zinhalas and Tamils and the Malayalis and everyone in Sri Lanka. And we came back, and we found that the, the discussions were pretty good. And Vinay and uh, Robbie and Danish Damodaran was part of this uh, conference. We discussed about it. We thought that we have to take it forward and let us organize some more discussions on this uh, philosophy. It is not about guru per se. Guru was a kind of an unseen presence in the whole discussions because it was organized by the Colombo Sri Narayana Guru. Guru naturally walked into our uh, plans. So we uh, organized this uh, Cochin Conference next year, and we called it the Backwaters Collective, the group which is organizing as a Backwaters Collective because we are not from the mainstream of academic discussions. We are from the backwaters of knowledge. So we thought that backwaters are as important as the mainstreams. So we organized this nice conference, about three days conference in uh, Cochin in 2010, 2011 in November, and again lots of people came for the thing and people like uh, Manu Chakravarti from Bangalore and you know, so many nice and we had good discussions. And all these rec the recordings and uh, the papers presented, we thought that we could make it to a book. Then uh, the Oxford University published it as a book. Came as uh, then this whole thing took its own momentum. Nothing was planned actually. We never wanted uh, to do a backwaters collective. Mm -hmm. We never wanted to bring Guru's philosophy anywhere. But it all emerged naturally. Guru walked into our our themes naturally. Backwaters collective name came naturally. Then the conferences started happening one year after one year after one year. And now uh, because of Corona, we haven't suspended the annual conference. Now it's become a small kind of a small festival of ideas. Crucial special festival of ideas, Dina, because uh, there is a great deal of talk uh, in India just now about decolonization, uh, and uh, some of that discussion uh, sort of conflates uh, the process of decolonization with the process of uh, what is called Hindu. Uh, assertion or greater hindu self confidence etc so in that context can you locate the particular way in which the Bat backwaters collective aims to uh, create a space for this decolonization of the mind see from the point of view of a guru perspective guru never had bothered about colonialism and so like bothered about colonialism Because for Guru, the self pervading the Britisher is also part of the same self which pervades over the most wretched, uh, you know, untouchable of the Indian subcontinent. So for him, this was all because of the kind of uh, uh, misunderstanding. 
misunderstanding is you can say this is exactly what is called the maya maya can be understood as misunderstanding more than as an illusion you know so for him uh, he's he i think he intuitively felt probably it's my understanding that one kind of operation can always be taken over by another kind of operation unless individual soul gets purified of all its morasses and all encrustments and the important thing is for the people to stop othering other human beings for him the othering concept was very important because he had used it in most of his philosophical poems that the other is the self the self is the other is he went on reiterating this in most of his uh, lifetime so for him uh, decolonization decolonization is not a project at all so i don't believe that uh, backwaters collective has got any interest in decolonization itself because for us the the colonialize the decolonized mind itself is part of a new colonial colonial setup so explain, how does it matter because, explain that because finally as long as you want a dominant uh, hierarchy where like people the people who want to decolonize indian uh, society indian civilization they want to become india the vishwa guru what's the meaning of vishwa guru that you are the one who will throw weight around everyone else it's not the guru that we consider in the benign sense it's the guru who will throw weight around they want to have a unipolar world with india as the leading dominant structure this is not what even gandhi or guru or anyone wanted we want to have a coexistence of everyone it's almost like the pradityya samalpada of uh, you know buddhism like everyone is networked into one whole and it emerges and it diminishes it emerges and it diminishes we cannot have one dominating the other it has to be a network of equals so i don't think this kind this whole project of decolonizing oneself and other things is not going to work anywhere it will be replacing one colonial structure of mind with another one that's all tricky question on uh, dina that if uh, one needs awareness of the self at that level of depth which you have described uh, then are the rest of us mere uh, ordinary mortals uh, condemned to not be able to come out of the violent impulse i mean for the ordinary householder how what are the possibilities of non violence then for everyone in ordinary household or mean everyone for everyone non violence is the only one which will keep the society intact even the most violent person uh, who uh, practices you stay goes out on the street and say jalao unko maro goli maar do salon ko and all they say but he wants his family his community to be safe his primary instinct is to have a safe comfortable congenial society it is his wrong misperception misperception that by killing others you become safe which he himself in the deep depth of his heart he knows that is why when they come on uh, civilized uh, conferences they will all talk the right things you know they will talk about how one has to be nice to each other and other things so this is basically that in the heart of heart everyone knows that being one on violence is the default condition of existence coexistence being a uh, for attaining power to capture power violence is always useful from time immemorial you find that it's always the use and misuse of violence which has brought people to power and they lost power also because of that yeah hana arent has has famously said no that it is not power that flows from the barrel of a gun only immediate obedience mm. so in that context how would you locate uh the atmosphere we find ourselves in now both in india and i think in large parts of the world where politics of hatred seems to be growing and gathering momentum yeah it has been always there this politics of hate it has become visible now that's only difference you know i had i used to wonder even in the 80s the early 80s when these kinds of uh, you know othering of the minorities and the poor and other things were not very very popular but in private conversations people used to talk the kind of stuff they talk now in the open there is nothing new about it now i realize that i was an idiot in the sense that naive enough to understand that these people were very nice people but they were always uh, holding such violent thoughts about the minorities and other people and some of them i used to read bhagavad gita or dharmapada and other things that doesn't mean that their behavior changes you know 
I remember that's a very famous, uh, I mean, in a private conversation, Asghar Ali engineer had told me once that this consciousness is one thing, but behavior is another. You can be very conscious of all the great values of life, but in behavior you can behave like a mean fellow who is ever. So he said, don't be surprised if the people who talk very big on their, uh, you know, on the stage will come on the private life, behave like, you know, absolute mean people. So behavior, Gandhi and Guru and all of the people who try to change the behavior, try to bring the alignment between your consciousness and behavior. That is a very big project. It may go another 500 years, 600 years before if human species exists for them to realize that is the right thing to do. There is a great deal, great deal of cynicism about this prospect of the human species uh, evolving to that level of consciousness. How do you address that cynicism? And especially in India, how do we look at it today in 2021 uh, when we have just come out of a century in which in the first half of the, you know, uh, 1900s, we have so many seers and mystics and saintly uh, philosophers who have seen precisely this promise of evolution of the human spirit. I mean, uh, there's apart from Guru, there is Ramana Maharishi, there is Sri Aurobindo. So how do you see that longing, Dina? What are, what are some of its challenges and uh, practical promises? See, the problem with metaphysics is that uh, it has got its own kind of a, a bubble in which it can operate. But the uh, problem is politics, because our conference is called Metaphysics and Politics. Politics is that, that it, uh, it has got it, uh, multiple formations and which can, uh, can go absolutely out of, out of island with any metaphysical concepts. So the main thing about um, uh, this evolution of the human being is that human beings have always been the good, bad and the ugly. There's never human beings where, you know, there was never a kind of a golden age where everything was like a Ram Rajya, where everyone were drinking only, you know, fresh milk and fruits and uh, being lovely, loving each other and, you know, that kind of Ram Rajya comes only in Puranas, Puranas or stories anyway. And uh, these seers always knew the basic, inf the, in the fallibility of human consciousness. This is this okay? Yeah, yeah, fine. This, um, Sages always knew, they had no illusions about the, the, the evil which, uh, which is there in the subconscious, you know, the, the, which is the dark under, under, underworld, which is there in, and beside every human being, you know. But he, they gave methods by which they can purify themselves and the few people who could do that, they have enormously larger kind of a weightage than the masses who are floating around with all their kind of a narrow interests. That is why even in Gandhi's time, how many people in the freedom movement actually practiced the, the, the concepts of, you know, of purity and ahimsa and, you know, loving the neighbor and the sermon on the moral concepts and other things that Gandhi used to practice. But the few who practiced this, they were great uh, heavyweights, you know, and they could really change the society. People always ask that with uh, such a orthodox and um, semi kind of um, in an ignorant society, how did we get a constitution like this? The 300 people or 400 people who wrote out, hundreds of people who sat in the Constituent Assembly brought out a wonderful, modern, extremely beautiful constitution which has got all the values of the Indic civilizations, both Buddhists and uh, Vedic and others. How did they bring it out? Because they were few, but they were having enough weight. So they could guide the people who didn't have the weight. So in the future also, this is what happened. And there would be cycles whereby the, 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 the evil also will get a sentence. In Upanishads, there is a very interesting thing about if you really see how Upanishads are written. Most of the Upanishads are written by people who had passed through some crisis in their life. After passing through a crisis or some tough questions or some inner kind of burning, they come and write a Upanishad. So if you don't have a crisis, you don't have a knowledge. That's, that's what our Indic methodology is. It's not only really Indic, all over the world is like that. Most of the great writings have come out of deep anguish and deep pain. So I have a feeling that even this process will bring out its own kind of you know, nectar. In close, closing, uh, Dina, a lot of young people I meet 
are uh, are inspired by the path of non-violence, but they also feel daunted. So, any advice that you could share with them from this, uh, the many, uh, you know, traditions and 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 uh, legacies that you inhabit, because I think you live inside them. Uh, any advice or and you know mainly how young people can cultivate the inner strength to be able to walk this path oh i am a wrong person to do that because i have not done any kind of a internal introspection or all this if you ask someone who has done that i'm just an ordinary reader of uh, books and you know a little bit of uh, you know thinking i do about it but i can tell one thing i can tell what non violence what a practitioner of non violence should not do i can tell that is you don't go it on the externals like avoiding uh, you know drinking goat milk and eating fruit and you know that is non violence is not uh, the truth non violence is basically not having any kind of kind of uh, resentment in your heart even an iota of resentment if you have in your heart even with all your external posturings your true violence will somehow come out somewhere so keep on purifying your inner self of all resentments and all kind of lacks all kinds of uh, what you call it, you know, anger and it's not very easy but one can easily first of all admit that i am not non violent enough that non violence is not a matter of just action itself it's a state of the mind even with all the non violent thing we may have to indulge in certain acts of violence sometimes you know gandhi was not a very nice man to deal with in the ashram people used to say is to find himself to be a very tough man he used to tell the truth on the face of the people telling the truth on the face is one of the most violent things you can hear you know? it's not a very easy thing and gandhi gandhi ashram was not a picnic spot for anyone that's why when gandhi when a communal riot occurred in bihar in 1940s gandhi said that what is this government doing why can't they just pull them behind bars and pull them bring punishment to them But for him, law was very important. It's not that it's not an absolutist concept of well, oh, they they have been under the concepts of non-violence. Why should we put them behind bars? No, no. Law is broken. They have to be put behind bars because in that way he was saying the government was in connivance with the rioters. That's what he was telling. The government itself was culpable. That's what happens even now. We can see. So you have to have a very relativistic concept of non-violence. But your dharma, your moral moral compass should be. always always directed towards the very values of life which gandhi used to very clearly say that it's uh, truth and non violence and truth and non violence he said is no new concept i have in, uh, discovered it's as old as the hills i love that statement it's as old as the hills but gandhi's english is one of the best english i've ever read in my life. i i know this should have maybe come earlier in the sequence um there's a lot of controversy about how gandhi ji is able to take a message of non violence uh, from the gita and uh, wh- whereas it is often read as an exhortation to war uh, that is how the narrative flow is seen so can you address that in in continuum here in your uh, you know uh, in as in a sense as a part of your uh, what you would share with young oh yeah gandhi ji had uh, he is a very brave man you know he in fact supported the original message of gita by making it uh, non violent and that is exactly the reason why the orthodox sections wanted to kill him from 1930 onwards how many times he was attempted uh, i mean it's not that gandhi was killed in 1940 it was so many attempts were there but the orthodox he very clearly knew what gandhi was doing to the so called orthodox hinduism you know Because he was bringing all the values of kindness and grace and you know humility to the so-called Bhagavad Gita, and this is something uh, I think almost like a sermon on sermon on the mount reading of Bhagavad Gita. He did it, you know. And why not? Why can't you do that? Because Gita is such a complex and ambiguous text that you can define the way Savarkar did it, or Tilak did it, or Gandhi did it, or anyone did it. and um, but that kind of uh, multiplicity of plurality of uh, opinions is not supported by orthodoxy that's the problem with orthodoxy that's why gandhi always used to be called a heterodox you know an un hindu anti hindu but he was the man who understood the fundamental values of the sanatana dharma much better than all these orthodox people that's a different matter so any 
any closing thoughts on uh, uh, the possibilities of nonviolence today as we speak in the there's a certain urgency to this concern right see uh, rajni we talk about possibilities of nonviolence is like possibilities of oxygen maybe people in delhi must be now wondering the possibilities of oxygen same way the people of the world whether they are in argentina or in <laughs> in in poland or in india or in sri lanka they must be thinking when will we get some more oxygen some more non violence that's all we can say there is no possibility of all this thing we have to only remove the carbon dioxide from the system so non violence is as primal to existence for a society as oxygen is for the human or the animal existence organic existence. So I don't even believe in this coinage of possibilities. It's not possibilities. Recovering is actually removing the toxicity, enveloping uh, non-violence. That's what we have to do. Exactly like we do in the climate. The toxicity comes from ox- the carbon dioxide. We want to remove that. We have to become carbon neutral. So we have become we have to become uh, you know much more uh, you know amenable to non-violence and uh, create the kind of a condition for a non-violent coexistence. it will be there as we are surviving you and me are sitting across and discussing because essentially the default condition is non violence had it been violent we wouldn't be able to sit and talk like this thank you thank you so much